the human skeleton as a biological structure is what we call plastic. It reacts to both internal and external stimuli. So it actually reflects aspects of the life of the person who it belonged to. So the human skeleton can reflect in changes to its form and shape and colour, health, patterns of activity, and broadly, things to do with the lifestyle of people in the past. It can also be modified by cultural activities. So, for example, you may be familiar with South American cranial binding, where people intentionally deformed their skulls into what they considered to be a more aesthetic and appealing shape. So we investigate lifestyle, we investigate health, we investigate disease. Occasionally, we can find evidence of cause of death. And the various kinds of analyses can be grouped under those that are demographic, to do with population structure, and those that are pathological, to do with disease and health. So we need to think very briefly about bone anatomy, because we need to know what we're looking for when we examine human skeletal remains. Now, there's a huge amount of complex biological detail behind human bone anatomy, but there are some core issues that we need to be able to identify and understand. If we look at an example of a long bone, you can see that it's divided into different sections. There is the shaft part, which we call the diaphysis, and there's the articular ends, which we call the epiphyses. The diaphysis and the epiphyses have slightly different structures, and one of the most notable things being that the epiphyses tend to contain what we call trabecular bone. This is sort of a lattice work of little bone um, um, tubes that fit together to form a sort of overall kind of bubbly looking type structure. Within the diaphysis, there's a lot more compact bone. That's the very hard structural bone. And within that, there is what we call the medullary cavity, which is where the bone marrow sits. Quite a lot of osteological studies are based on looking much closer at bone. They're based on looking at the microstructure of human bone. And images of this can show you quite a complex structure that's made up of a single unit known as an osteon, which is a sort of round bone kind of circular cylindrical unit and also a network of blood vessels and nerves. It's worth pointing out that this network of blood vessels is quite important because, of course, bone is a living tissue. And when you're alive, it is reacting um, and growing and replacing itself at a relatively regular rate. And in fact, this is the reason why osteology kind of works as a discipline. It's because bone actually does act like a living tissue. It changes, it responds and it reacts over time. There are various ways of, of understanding and categorising different parts of the human skeleton. We can divide different types of bone into five broad groups. There are long bones, things like the femur, for example. Short bones, which are things like the tarsal bones. There are flat bones, which by their nature are flat, like the bones of the cranial vault. There are irregular bones, which basically are things that don't fit into those four categories, things like the vertebrae. And then there are sesamoid bones, which are slightly different. They're defined by the fact they sit within, within ligaments and tendons. The most well-known sesamoid bone is actually the patella, the kneecap. So we can classify bones by their shape. We can also think about the way in which they interact together, because, of course, the human skeleton as a unit functions as one when you're alive. You might be familiar with the fact that bones will articulate together at joints and that sometimes they also intersect at sutures. This is what goes on within the skull. And there are three major types of joints. Fibrous joints are composed of fibrous connective tissue surrounding the bone and they're effectively immobile. Now, people don't necessarily assume that an immobile bone structure would count as a joint, but some joints are immobile in that they don't actually move against each other. The cranial sutures, the um, areas where the bones of the cranial vault of the skull join together, are fibrous joints, as actually are the joints between your teeth and your jaw. They're joints, but they're immobile. There are a set of joints called cartilaginous, and they're categorised by the fact that the soft tissue structures are composed of fibrocartilage and fibrous tissues. They have reasonably restricted movement. One example is the pubic symphysis, which sits right at the front of the pelvis and also the joints between the vertebrae. They don't really move a great deal, but they are characteristically and biologically slightly different than the fibrous joints. And then finally, the joints you might be more familiar with, 
things like the hip joint, the shoulder joint, are what we call synovial joints. They have a complex system of articular cartilage and synovial fluid, which lubricates and facilitates movement within the joint, and they are the most mobile of all the joints. So that's how the skeleton sits together and how different bones articulate and function. I'm just going to touch briefly on joint function because, of course, the different shapes and forms of joints are not the only way we can categorise the function of the skeleton. Joints function in different ways. You're probably familiar again with the hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint. You might also be familiar with the elbow, which is what we call a hinge joint because it literally just bends up and down. It doesn't have much in the way of rotation at the elbow. And then there's a variety of other kinds of joints as well, which all relate to the shape and form and function of that particular structure within the body. So now we know a little bit more about how the skeleton fits together and how the various joints and sutures work, we can think about how the skeleton functions as a unit. What is its biological role within the body? Well, there are various different things that the skeleton serves to do. It offers, first of all, protection. So if you imagine the skull, you imagine the thorax, the ribs and the vertebrae, they offer protection to soft tissue, the organs and the brain. They're solid and rigid and can withstand trauma and stress. The skeleton as a whole offers support and facilitates mobility. Essentially, all the soft, squidgy bits hang off the skeleton. It has a biochemical function in terms of chemical storage and metabolism. You might be familiar with the role of bone marrow, for example. And also, it's worth pointing out that some parts of the skeleton actually interact directly with the environment. So your teeth, they actually process and interact with the environment through chewing. You can use them to modify materials. One example is the processing of leather that we find ancient communities do actually using their teeth. They can soften leather and produce something that's more suitable for manufacture. It's worth pointing out that the nature of the skeleton is a biological structure comes with a series of rather complex terminological requirements. You will find osteological reports and osteologists using a series of biological terms to describe directions, planes, angles and movements. These terms all relate directly to one specific thing. So one of the most common ones is anterior, which means the front, and posterior, which means the back. Superior means the top, and inferior means the bottom. And there's a whole suite of these terms that you might want to get familiar with if you're going to understand what osteologists are actually talking about when they describe human skeletal remains.